are very proud to have Mr. Steve Lori presenting via Zoom today. Uh, Stephen recently retired as the Executive Director of the Canadian Mental Health Association, the Toronto branch. His career in mental health advocacy spans over 40 years. Throughout his tenure, he has written and lectured extensively on policy issues, both nationally and internationally. His accolades include National Leadership in Mental Health, the President's Award for Outstanding Contributions by Addictions and Mental Health Ontario, and in 2016 was named to the Order of Canada for his contributions as a leader, scholar, and advocate. In 2017, he was honoured by CAMH as one of Canada's different uh, difference makers in mental health and addictions. So we are honoured to have Steve here today with us. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly, and, and uh, bienvenue à Montréal, à tout. Uh, and I, I've got uh, two colleagues with me who are going to provide some uh, commentary, and I want to introduce them before I get into my uh, remarks. Uh, so um, really thrilled to have Jennifer Chambers, uh, who is the executive director and founder of the Empowerment Council, uh, systemic advocates in addictions and mental health. It's a peer advocacy organization. She's currently the co-chair of the Mental Health and Addiction Advisory Panel to the Toronto Police Services Board and a member of the Anti-Racism uh, Advisory Panel and PACER. The Empowerment Council is the only mental health and addiction peer advocacy organization in the, in the country that regularly intervenes in charter cases before the Supreme Court of Ontario and acquires standing at inquests in Ontario, and uh, you'll you'll see when Jennifer speaks about uh, uh, the uh, service user uh, perspective um, uh, that you know she's been a very valuable uh, uh, advocate, uh, particularly at inquests, shining the light on the failures of the mental health system. And we also have Upala Chandra Sikara, who uh, I've worked with for many years at CMHA. Uh, who's got over 20 years of experience in the health sector, ranging from frontline work with individuals and families to supporting mental health and addictions programming province-wide. And she was also involved with the Mental Health Commission. Uh, so she has had a role implementing a national strategy to address mental health. She's an assistant professor uh, at uh, Factor Inwintash Faculty of Social Work at the U of T. And she's on the board of directors of the Daymark Foundation, a national foundation committed to supporting the mental health of Canadians. And she was a member of the Toronto Police Services Board from 2017 to 2020, uh, and actually uh, supported uh, Jennifer and me in uh, taking on the leadership role that we currently have at the Toronto Police Services Board. So Upal is going to talk about mental health and justice issues and equity issues, and Jennifer is going to talk about the involvement and the engagement and the experience of people with lived experience and I'm going to invite them to you know provide commentary uh, after my remarks uh, and then you know we'll open it for questions. So um, there is no health without mental health. Um, I wish I could say I invented this statement. Uh, I didn't. Uh, it's from the World Health Organization um, and apparently it actually comes from a, a Canadian uh, uh, Dr. McKinnon who was a deputy minister of health. Um, I, I developed a, 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 an amendment to it, which I said, if there's no health without mental health, there's no mental health without housing. And I'll turn to that later on in my remarks. Uh, here's the issue. Um, you know, 20% of us will experience a diagnosable mental illness every year. Uh, it, it, there used to be a figure from StatsCan saying it was one in five in terms of lifetime prevalence, but we now know um, that even pre-COVID, 20% of us uh, will, will experience uh, a, a major mental health issue uh, that, that, that could require treatment. And that also includes addictions. The Mental Health Commission estimates that by age 40, 50% of us will. And uh, it also goes on to say uh, that if we reach age 90, which increasingly more and more of us will, over 70% of us will. So that positions mental health and addictions issues as a population health issue. And even if we're not among the people who experience a mental health and addictions problem, um, we are 
connected to friends and family who do. So mental health affects all of us. And that's where you get this idea about, you know, there is no health without mental health. And of course, the paradox is that mental health has tended to be ignored as a major health issue until recently. But the annual cost to the Canadian economy is at least $50 billion. And the Mental Health Commission estimates that if we don't do a better job in responding to mental health issues, both in the community and in the workplace, it will cost us $3.5 trillion. It accounts also for 13% of the global disease burden, and that is actually one of the larger areas of global disease burden. Now, um, ISIS, the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Services, I like to call them the good ISIS, uh, have identified that the disease burden here in Ontario and in Canada is 1.5 times that of cancer and 7.5 times that of infectious disease. Now that latter figure may need to be adjusted given our COVID experience. But again, uh, if you go back to every year, uh, one in five Canadians are experiencing a mental health difficulty. Uh, that puts it in perspective uh, because, you know, we, we don't see one in five Canadians experiencing cancer or heart disease. The big problem has been a lack of a whole government approach. Not only have we failed to transfer the resources that uh, provincial governments had available to them following the closure of the provincial asylums uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, but we haven't done a good enough job at creating community capacity, both to access services and also to provide access to the social determinants of health like housing. And that stems because of the F word, funding, or the lack of it. And it also stems from stigma. In fact, Dr. Heather Stewart, who, um, for those of you who are John Milton fans, uh, she wrote a book called Paradigms Lost, uh, as opposed to Paradise Lost. And, and she uh, identified that the lack of funding was one of the artifacts of structural stigma. So, as I said, stigma leads to underfunding, it leads to low priority, even in the United Kingdom, where in 2011, they passed legislation guaranteeing parity of, of esteem. Um, Norman Lamb, who was the Minister of Mental Health at the time, said he thought it would take a generation before the policy equivalency and, and focus was achieved. And so we're left with incremental change. Now, what I want to do is take you back 100 years. Um, the CMHA was founded by Dr. Claire Hinks, who himself lived with mental illness. Um, and he talks about the surveys he did uh, and the services he provided in the community beginning in 1915. We decided right from the start to have it a teaching clinic. And we made all our examinations all of them, with groups of nurses, social workers around us. Our patients were referred by the police, they were referred by teachers, they were referred by social workers, they were referred by doctors, they were referred by clergymen, they were referred by the whole community. And we were flooded with them, everything. So think about that. He's talking about the situation beginning in 1915 when he and Dr. Casey Clark established the first community mental health clinic in downtown Toronto. And he said they were flooded and they got referrals from everywhere. That hasn't changed. Also, there were high needs. Whoops, I gotta go back one. We know more than anybody else in Canada, the tremendous numbers of people who are suffering from mental ailments of one kind and another. And we also know that our resources, our facilities for giving them help are terribly inadequate. So that was Hinks speaking. He founded CMHA in um, 1918 and actually uh, that recording comes from 1964, just before he passed away. Uh, it, it was an interview with Lloyd Robertson of the CTV National. Um, but, you know, fast forward to today, uh, the Mental Health Commission uh, published a report of mental health indicators, and out of 63, uh, 21 of them 
were significant areas of concern, including unmet needs, suicide rates for adults, youth, seniors, caregiver stress, self-rated mental health of nor Northerners, LGBTQ, and seniors. There were some positive signs, but only six. Um, immigrant belonging, the, the ability of mental health first aid, uh, and paradoxically, uh, even though seniors are a, a high-risk group for, senior, uh, for suicide, there also appeared to be some progress being made in diminishing suicidal intent among seniors. Now, we also know that COVID has had an impact. Uh, many people have said that if the mental health system was struggling prior to COVID, it's struggling now uh, as a result of COVID, and it will continue to struggle uh, as we learn to live with COVID. Angus Reid in the spring of 2020 identified that 24% of Canadians said they were struggling, 44% they were worried, 41% were anxious, and 19% uh, were optimistic, and 50% said that their mental health was worse than before COVID. And again, that was two years ago. Just recently, the Mental Health Commission uh, released a, a study that they did with Leger um, that says two years into the COVID uh, pandemic, and many people are still reporting significant mental health use and substance concerns. Um, and also people who uh, have mental health, uh, substance use issues also have mental health concerns and vice versa. And this isn't unique to the pandemic. It's actually, even though the two sectors, addictions and mental health have been, been separate, we know there's a, a, a really important correlation about what leads to different types of behavior. And, uh, and, and that's why um, the, the notion of trying to deal with mental health and substance abuse issues simultaneously rather than separately is so important. Also, the pandemic impacts people in different ways. Uh, more research is needed to understand the distinct experiences of uh, social, cultural, and ethno-racialized groups, but we know from the data that uh, ethno-racial communities uh, and indigenous communities had much higher rates of COVID uh, and um, that efforts needed to be targeted at those populations because many of them were in um, uh, work that didn't provide benefits, no sick leave, um, limited protection, uh, and uh, some were living in overcrowded conditions. And again, if you look in any city across Canada and say, where did we have spikes in COVID? You'll see it's in uh, poor neighborhoods where uh, people uh, were working in, uh, you know, actually the, the essential jobs, the grocery stores, the, um, the distribution warehouses and things like that. So we do need to target our efforts to uh, racialized and marginalized communities. COVID is expected to have long lasting impacts on mental health and substance use and the full impact of pandemic might only become apparent over time. But for example, many people say they were drinking more or using drugs more as a result of COVID. And despite the increased mental health and substance use concerns, and despite more availability of online help, um, access to services has remained relatively low. It's still a problem uh, in, in the country. Uh, uh, governments are beginning to respond by uh, expanding access to psychotherapy, uh, but um, the bulk of the population still reports, particularly if you've got complex mental health issues, huge problems in getting timely services. Now, there was a bit of paradox. Uh, Roger McIntyre from the Royal Society actually looked at uh, the suicide rate in, in uh, Canada, and he actually showed that in the first year of the pandemic, there was a 32% decline in suicides, uh, but he attributed that to the CERB and the availability of online supports, which I think for those of you in the CCU, uh, speaks to the importance of, of, of social infrastructure, uh, both access to service, but access to economic supports. We do know, uh, regardless of the sector you're working in, but particularly in the health sector, and a shout out to uh, any of your members who are working in, in health, there are workforce mental health issues. Uh, these include burnout, wage and benefit poverty for people who are uh, in uh, doing part-time work or who are in particular, uh, some of the people doing community support work, both in, in mental health and in uh, uh, work with seniors. 
it, we, it requires action to foster a resilient workforce. Um, that includes you know, access to uh, supports uh, on the job, um, but it also means, you know, and, and, and I'm sure you folks have focused on this, the importance of a decent wage, the importance of a benefit plan, the importance of the availability of, of to take time off work if you're having mental health problems and you need support. And as I've said earlier, the services were under strain and access was poor prior to COVID. So this is probably the, the health challenge uh, of the uh, uh, 21st century. I spoke earlier about funding and this slide shows you that actually at the 10 years after Ontario closed the large asylums, um, and I mean, they kept you know nine provincial psychiatric hospitals, which are now specialty hospitals, but nine years after Ontario closed over uh, 10,000 psychiatric beds, the mental health share of health spending was 11.5%. By the mid eighties, it had to decline to less than 10%, and it's now about 6%. That doesn't mean uh, that we've been cutting funding for mental health services, but what it does mean is that we are investing more in other areas of healthcare as opposed to mental health. This shows that other countries have done more. Uh, this is the comparative per capita uh, of new mental health investments. And so this is New Zealand, which uh, over an eight year period from uh, 2004 to 2011, actually uh, increased their per capita funding by 198, almost $200 per capita. Canada, increased our funding um, by $5.22 and Ontario by $16.45. And just to put it in perspective, if we were to try and achieve the Mental Health Commission's recommended standard and target uh, from 10 years ago, ironically, of um, mental health spending should be 9% of health spending, that per capita amount is $85 per Canadian. So it raises the question, why can't we afford to make these investments? Another thing to think about, because often when you look at mental health issues uh, or any public policy issue, you know, the, the temptation is to say, oh, it's a real mess and we don't know what to do about it. But the reality is we actually do know what to do about it. There is a growing evidence base about things that make a difference, that promote mental health, that in, uh, uh, result in recovery and um, life years gained rather than life years lost. So for example, the evidence-based for assertive community treatment, which are multidisciplinary teams that target people with uh, uh, serious mental health issues, um, intensive case management, um, individual placement and support. This is the way to do employment programs and it can result in people choosing, getting and keeping jobs. Um, EPI stands for early psychosis intervention. And there's lots of evidence that um, begun, there's been, work, there's been work done nationally in Canada through the Open Minds Access Project. Uh, but uh, Dr. Patrick McGorry uh, developed this, these concepts uh, almost 20 years ago in Australia and it's spread worldwide. And if you're a young person with psychosis and you are able to access a multidisciplinary team, the results show that you stay in school or you get a job, you have better relations with your family and you don't begin the cycle of repeated admissions in and out of psychiatric hospitals. Returning to uh, assertive community treatment and the evidence base there, uh, I was uh, privileged to uh, chair the assertive community treatment team ACT data group uh, in the early 2000s here in Ontario. And we didn't have a a very sophisticated database, but we got every single assertive community treatment team, there were about five, 55 of them at the time, to submit their annual data about client characteristics and outcomes to us. And it was all on an Excel spreadsheet. But what did we find? We found that prior to enrollment in a, an assertive community treatment team, people spent an average of 50 days in hospital per year. After six years in ACT, there was an 82% reduction in hospitalization. In other words, not, you didn't 
stop hospitalization, but you went from 50 days down to about 13 days over a six year period if people stayed engaged in services. And that actually translated to uh, a $1.4 million savings to the system for every assertive community treatment team that was put in place. There's growing evidence about housing first. We actually know how to end homelessness. You provide housing for people and then you flex supports according to their needs and that works. Uh, we actually had the largest um, research project on housing first in the world here in Canada, uh, led by the Mental Health Commission. And they found that uh, improved tenancy was twice as likely if housing first was provided as opposed to treatment as usual. We have some challenges and opportunities to grow the evidence base for peer and family support. But, you know, many years ago, back uh, in about uh, I think it was 2013, the Mental Health Commission released uh, a, a report called Making the Case for Peer Supports. We had uh, Mary O'Hagan from, and Robin Priest from New Zealand and Australia uh, do an extensive literature review, cr crisscross the country talking to people who'd been involved in peer support, uh, both providing it and experiencing it. And basically the finding was it's an underutilized and under-recognized area of, the, of mental health care. And it really requires substantial investments which have yet to occur. There's growing evidence as I've cited earlier on the economic costs of uh, our failure to act on mental health. And we do have a challenge with regard to mental health promotion because there you, if you're intervening and trying to promote mental health in the community, you need you know, long-term research studies to show that it actually made a difference. But there's certainly qualitative evidence uh, for people who are exposed uh, to mental health initiatives and rapid access to service that it does make a difference in their lives. And, and uh, of course, even the evidence we have isn't directly tied to funding decisions. For example, one of the problems in healthcare generally is that most of the funding is spent on hospitals, doctors and pharmaceuticals. And we have the same paradigm in mental health, even though, as I've tried to indicate to you, there's an evidence base on uh, what can be done effectively in the community that keep people out of hospitals. So there are some game changers uh, that provide you know, potential for us to um, improve the lot of people who are experiencing mental health difficulties. You know, there's a real paradox here. Um, you know, Bell Let's Talk every year uh, raises about $100 million for mental health, and they are to be commended for raising awareness and, and creating a national conversation. But that $100 million, as I've indicated earlier, is a bit of a drop in the bucket, considering we need an annual investment of $3.1 billion every year. And in Ontario, there's an annual deficit in mental health care of $1.5 billion. But the game changers, uh, e-mental health. Um, this is, again, and we've seen some progress here as a result of um, uh, uh, the availability of online supports uh, during the pandemic. And even prior to the pandemic uh, in Ontario and British Columbia, people had access to psychotherapy through Bounce Back, which is a, a wonderful program that provides uh, uh, resources online as well as coaching in many languages and has been very, very effective in reducing uh, symptoms from uh, mild to moderate depression. In fact, um, the, the approach to bounce back that we now have here in Ontario and, and, and in British Columbia uh, was developed in the UK where uh, they actually realized that um, if somebody has mild to moderate depression and seeks help and they go to a doctor, they're likely to be prescribed uh, medication. Uh, but the National uh, Institute on Clinical Evaluation in the UK identified that a cognitive behavioral therapy approach uh, was much more efficacious. So again, things like Bounce Back and the, um, the MindAbility program here in, in Ontario and the ability to you know, call in and get help does make a difference and will bring mental health services to people in a more convenient way. Um, and, and that's one of the things that's emerged in terms of the research that's been done about uh, email health, that 
in fact, people like the convenience that, you know, you can talk to a therapist on your phone. Um, there, uh, there was a, a study done in Chicago among homeless youth and the skill testing question is, you know, if besides housing, you could give uh, homeless youth one thing, what would it be? Well, the answer is you give them a cell phone and a data plan uh, because what they found was homeless youth actually had very dense communities and were in contact with each other um, constantly. Um, uh, they also liked the ability to be able to text message their therapist. The one thing that didn't work out is they couldn't get counseling when they wanted it because the therapist's hours weren't as flexible as uh, the homeless youth wanted them to be. But again, uh, leveraging technology to bring services to people uh, is, is really important. And there are literally thousands of apps. Uh, some of them have been curated by uh, groups in the UK and the Mental Health Commission is doing some work on that. But to give you an example, Dr. David Goldblum, a senior advisor at, at CAMH and former chair of the Mental Health Commission, uh, has talked about um, a, an app called WISA, which was developed in India in response to the fact that um, there aren't very many mental health services at the village level or in the panchayats. And um, this is a, um, an AI-fueled uh, uh, service. And basically, you uh, it's WYSA for any of you who want to check it out online. Um, I've tried it. You, you can you type in uh, your response to the questions and then they give you coaching about how you're feeling and ways to look at. And then you can also be linked to a therapist. Um, and when WISA was initially developed, because it was AI fueled, one of the uh, things they actually had to do was slow down the uh, the response, the AI response, because you would get the you would get a further probing question or a suggestion of you know way, ways to think about your behavior before you'd even finish typing in the question. So my point is that you know the internet and e mental health do provide uh, important opportunities for us to uh, get better access to um, mental health services. Um, Primary care integration. Um, this has been talked about, but uh, and paradoxically, there's one community which has been doing it for about 40 years, Hamilton, um, uh, through the um, work of Dr. Nick Cates. Um, family, 80% of the people in family practice uh, have access, rapid access to a psychiatrist if they need it, uh, both in terms of consultation and um, direct patient care. And that's a model that needs to be uh, developed further and implemented across the country. Um, also, um, the other side of primary care integration is recognizing that people with serious mental illness uh, are at much more risk of premature death. And so we need to make sure that we connect uh, people who are living with serious and complex mental health issues uh, to primary care so that they can get the care for their COPD or their heart disease or their risk of cancer. And some of it is also even being able to uh, deal with food security issues and promote healthy eating. A third area is the iCircle Thrive Cities, which is an international movement uh, looking at building uh, population-based mental health at a community level. Um, there's also work being done here in Ontario in particular uh, through CMHA Ontario and UPLA may want to talk a bit about it. Um, there's a program called uh, Talk Today that engages young hockey players in discussing mental health issues, you know, right in their hockey teams because it was found that uh, young people came to hockey with issues that uh, needed to be dealt with. Um, but overall, as I've said earlier, we, we need to have long-term funding strategies with targets to support both early intervention and close treatment gaps. So again, just to, uh, to highlight a little bit about Thrive, it promotes the well-being of the population and uh, advancing service system improvements. London Thrive in the UK uh, has a comprehensive wellness strategy through the Community Mental Health Alliance. And an interesting story about how this got started um, there was a new office tower opened in London and Deloitte's, which is an international accounting firm, uh, was part of it. And one of their partners jumped from uh, one of the top floors uh, at the opening of the building. And what this did is, I mean, unfortunately, the person lost his life, 
but the corporations who were involved in that building realized that they needed to do something to bring uh, mental health care to workers. Uh, and, and so they developed this community mental health alliance, which is quite literally thriving and, and making sure that people have access to mental health, both in terms of preventative work as well as access to services. Philadelphia is working on helping the city become trauma-informed and doing a lot of that work, engaging the arts community and, and doing it at a neighborhood level. New York City Thrive is working in the schools. They have a mental health service core, uh, and they're, uh, which actually targets uh, senior centers and youth uh, centers. Uh, they have 10,000 supportive housing units being developed. They're engaged with the faith community. Sydney, Australia, realized that a lack of affordable housing is a major barrier to mental wellness. And so they've got an audacious target to develop 745 units over, 1,000 units over 20 years. Uh, Toronto has joined. So this just gives you an idea of what is going on in London and, and some of the work they found. Uh, um, they've got, and they're focusing again on mental health and well-being. Uh, 13 people every day uh, uh, have evidence of poor mental health, which re results in uh, 2 million Londoners needing help. They, their aspirations are a city where uh, individuals and communities take the lead, city free of stigma and discrimination, city maximizing the health of young people, healthy, productive workforce, services that are there when you need them, and a zero suicide city. And Toronto has picked up on many of these uh, uh, goals as well. Um, Thrive Toronto um, has, again, a similar approach. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that you can see that on screen, uh, but if you can't, um, I've given you the, the web site and they're looking at enhancing supportive housing in Toronto, uh, changing uh, Toronto's ability to live, work and play, and, and also they're targeting some initiatives at the neighborhood level. There are some workplace resources that you may want to have a look at. Uh, there's uh, Mental Health Works, uh, which is a program that is uh, available to uh, um, workplaces to sort of begin to take the pulse of the organization and identify what the workplace issues are. Uh, there's also Not Myself Today, which is run by uh, the uh, CMHA National Office, uh, which has a toolkit for people to have discussions about how they're doing, recognizing that people come to work sometimes um, because uh, dealing with issues, you know, in, in their home, you know, uh, uh, an elderly parent, uh, an, uh, an adolescent, marital strain, and that affects how they work. And this, these are conversation guides that you can have in the workplace. It doesn't turn your workers into co-workers into therapists, but it helps you be supportive. Um, and, you know, they've actually got little pins that you can wear about that, that you can pin on saying what your mood is. And I discovered there's a new mood called MEH, M-E-H. Anyway, um, these are resources that are available to your union and other workplaces. Uh, 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 the Mental Health Works is led by CMHA Ontario. And as, as I said, it's a consulting service, but they tailor programs to workplaces. So I'm gonna come to my last words and then bring in my colleagues, uh, Jennifer and Upala for their words. Um, I think it's important that uh, we avoid the law of inverse relevance. And again, I, I highlighted the, the fact that sometimes we think we're in a nirvana-like environment because of Bell Let's Talk, uh, that everybody's focused on mental health. Uh, but the law of inverse relevance was uh, developed uh, in a BBC program called Yes Minister in the 90s, which sort of looked at the workings of government and the, the two prime characters are uh, Minister James Hacker and his deputy, Sir Humphrey Appleby. And there's a scene where they're revealing correspondence that's come in from constituents. And um, the minister, James Hacker says, you know, um, one of the things we really need to do is avoid the law of inverse relevance as we try and respond to what we're hearing from our constituents. And Sir Humphrey Appleby says, Minister, what's the law of inverse relevance? And Hacker turns to him and says, Sir Humphrey, the law of inverse re relevance states, the more we talk about something, the less we intend to do about it. And I think you know, that 
some would argue is the paradox of our mental health environment, but I take you back to how we began. Um, there is no health without mental health, and I really support the work of your union to invite me and my colleagues to provide some commentary for you on mental health and know that uh, you've identified mental health as a priority, and I thank you for that. So I'm going to bring in Jennifer to talk for about five minutes or so uh, about you know, her reactions uh, either to what I've said or uh, any other things she wants to share about the experience of people who live with mental illness and how they find access to services and other things going. Jennifer, over to you. Uh, I'm executive director of the Empowerment Council, which is a peer advocacy organization. So we consist entirely of people who have at some point had mental health or addictions issues. Uh, and we do advocacy on the systemic level. So we look for system-wide change. Um, there's a couple of different levels of engagement that service users can be involved in, um, in terms of empowering people's healthcare. One's the individual level uh, and the other is the systems level. Uh, these are some different ways that we can create meaningful choices which are necessary for people to be empowered. Um, we talk about how it's important to uh, involve organizations of people who are representing people with mental health or addiction issues. I think no one knows better than a union <laughs> the value of a collective voice and the importance of having the broad perspective that a collective voice brings and the dedication that voice has to the rights um, of the group as a whole. And yet what often happens in healthcare is um, representation is addressed by sort of just sort of plucking individual people and putting them on different committees, which obviously seriously disadvantages them in terms of uh, the other people on the committees because uh, they can't speak collectively. They don't have the, um, to the, the background that the other people who are at the committee tend to have. And this is a chart just uh, to demonstrating the different levels of citizen participation and the um, power that they can bring. Again, I probably have to convince you of this less than almost any other audience <laughs> that I address. Um, there are conditions that uh, create um, opportunities for meaningful participation, and there's those that um, act against them. And then if there's anybody here who is a service user and wants to empower the ser service user voice in a healthcare organization, here's some sort of how-to steps and contact information for me um, when doing so. So because of who you are, I'm also gonna address a bit the challenging relationship that's existed at times between service user groups and unions. Um, we've had some very good experiences with unions. Uh, for example, very early in the work that I did, uh, we had support from, uh, a non-healthcare related union, I believe it was auto workers that provided some funding for people who were wanting to bring forward some um, institutional abuse that had happened and who had no money to be able to do so. But there are some tensions when the sort of product is people and the workers and the product, the users of the service can have diverging interests. Um, so there's been some unfortunate moves by healthcare unions. Uh, there's sort of a, a union newsletter that went out many years ago that showed the the workers as sort of humans in a cave and the patients as ravening beasts outside of the cave. There were some <clears throat> pamphlets introduced really highlighting everything possible that was negative about people in the um, mental health care system as part of a sort of collective bargaining strategy. Um, the most recent incident actually had a, an excellent resolution. There was a poster put right outside a uh, very large mental health and addiction facility of someone, a woman with a black eye and said it was from the union and, and the violence had to stop. So we adjusted that this seemed to depict everybody within that facility as if they were violent. And initially we got no traction with that objection. Um, but then we pointed out that members of their own union obviously are people who also have had mental health and addictions issues. And some people within the un union stood up and objected to it as well. So the resolution we ended up having was not only was the poster taken down, um, but the union funded us putting up a poster to sort of counteract the previous one with information about things like people with mental health issues are more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators of it. And so I think that the issue in that case, it wasn't that there is not violence by patients against staff because there is, and there's also neglect and abuse that happens um, by staff. Um, but the important thing is not to suggests that all the members of a group 
um, are doing are committing these negative acts. I think that uh, right now we're looking at um, some of the issues of racism that exist in mental health care. Something I learned from doing a lot of the work we've done with police is the importance of keeping demographic information on uh, use of force. And there is use of force within the mental health system. There's use of restraints and um, seclusion and chemical restraint. So I asked um, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health to start analyzing uh, the use of restraints demographically. And it took a long time for us to get um, them to do that. And when they did it emerged that um, patients who are black were being restrained at about three times the rate of patients who are white. Um, so I try to introduce this a lot when talking about um, defund the police because there's kind of simplistic analysis that suggests that we can just get rid of policing and replace it with mental health and that will necessarily be better for people on the receiving end of mental health services, but it isn't, um, well, people are less likely to die, although they have died in restraints and we've been involved in those deaths, uh, investigation of those deaths. Um, uh, it's still not necessarily a safe place to be. So, uh, so our voice at inquests has been very much about recommending um, changes to policing but also recommending non-coercive community-based supports. So um, the city of Toronto actually has a pilot um, project going on, on now of four community-based uh, mental health supports, one of which is particularly focused on the, for the black community and one of which is particularly focused for the indigenous community uh, so that people have options beyond just police or institutional um, care or, or more coercive care. The police unions, I'd have to say, have not typically been friendly to our to our efforts, um, nor really any community interventions in policing. Uh, I think it, it might have improved a bit as we are including within our auspice addressing um, the well-being of um, police as well, because the well-being of people with mental health issues, um, no matter who they are, is um, part of our mandate. I'd say that the the situation for people in in crisis in Ontario is. Uh, might be improving. It, it has improved with police, um, but it takes a constant effort. It's not like it just improves like that. It's more like it goes like this. Um, so for example, two um, places we've gone a little bit downhill. Uh, one is there was a time when there's a panel of people with personal experience of mental health issues and policing who educated all of the uniformed police officers in Toronto for a year. I spent a year doing that. And um, in the following number of years, there's very few, following eight years, I think only one death of people by police, which may or may not be related to that, but it is a correlation. And they're also used, to, Ontario also used to be a, a world leader in its support for peer support run organizations or peer based organizations. And that has um, seriously lost ground as well, while growing elsewhere um, in other parts of the world. So that, and, and there is evidence that, that can reduce hospital days. Um, oh, is Lyria saying it's a cost-effective alternative because while well, almost anything is cheaper than a hospital, it also has led, I think, to the very poor rates of relative pay that people get for doing similar work uh, when classified as peers. Um, so I'll just finish by talking a little bit about what Steve referred to. Uh, while we do need uh, vast improvements in choices and availability of mental health supports, particularly those of a trauma-based nature, uh, there's very little trauma-based um, therapy available for people. What, despite the evidence that the vast majority of people in mental health and addiction services have a history of trauma. Um, but there's also, difficulties with thoughts and feelings is a, a human condition. And to some extent, we need to address it by improving the ability of the population as a whole to talk to people about their thoughts and feelings in a helpful way. Uh, an example of this would be to start treating feelings as the sort of necessary part of healing that they are, and not as a failure uh, to be an adult. 
I think that people sometimes think that uh, the mental health system is good with emotions. They're actually terrible with emotions. They tend to drug emotions out of existence and treat them as symptoms, uh, where in fact people need to be able to, for instance, cry. Uh, so someone told me that when she was in the mental health system as an inpatient and her father died and she was crying, uh, she was immediately medicated to a zombie-like state so that she still feels she's carrying the heaviness of that around because she didn't get to mourn it and she didn't get the support she needed to do that. Uh, so I will stop there and so to be sure that Upala has a chance to talk to you as well. Great, thanks so much. And thanks so much to the CCU and Steve and Jennifer for inviting me. I have a few slides that I will share. I think this is a really good segue because Jennifer started talking about the impact of forms of dis discrimination. And what I wanna really take some time to talk to you about is how that impacts our health. Um, I wear a lot of hats, but today I'm here with you as a social worker who's been in the field for about 20 years. So I would really ask you to think about, you know, what does discrimination actually mean to you? Because so many of us work in this um, helping profession, right, in service of others. And we think that because we do all this work in service of others, that there's no way that we can be acting or engaging in discrimination. And what I wanna challenge you to really think about is how discrimination and all of its forms actually seep into our work. And I do a lot of work with unions and I'm so supportive because they really are the advocates. You are the advocates uh, for people in the field. But I really want you to think about this word and how you've seen it enacted. I love this picture. This, um, I share this a lot. And this really depicts what health disparities are which are differences in health outcomes that are avoidable, unfair, and systematically related to social inequality and disadvantage. So if you look, this is a picture of a hospital. If you look at the pink road, it's a pretty straight road. And then you look at the yellow road, there's got some you know, winding winds in it. But if you look at the blue road, you're not even sure that it goes from point A to point B. You could be lost in this road going around in circles and circles for years. And sometimes this is what it's like to access healthcare, right? And the way in which which road we're on depends on our access to the social determinants of health and our experiences of discrimination. Um, in, in Canada, Dr. Dennis Efrael from York University has identified all of these as the key factors that Im impact on our health. So you'll see that education, employment, income is on this list. You also see that race and indigenous ancestry and gender and gender identity, all of those things are also on this list. And then what I want to raise with you and challenge you to think about is, it's not our race that determines our health, rather racism, right? And it's not the fact that we have indigenous ancestry that determines our health, rather our experience of discrimination based on indigenous ancestry, our experience of discrimination based on our gender identity, our gender expression, our sexual orientation. And it's all of these factors that we really have to think about when we're also thinking about mental health. Uh, Steve mentioned this earlier. We have this saying in the mental health field, in order to have positive mental health, you need a home, a job, and a friend. And that is a direct reference to the social determinants. And here are the three key determinants that we have determined in our field. Uh, in order to have positive mental health. Social inclusion, belonging, so important in order for us to have positive mental health. Access to, ec access to economic resources, so things like housing, employment, income, those things are really important. And then the third, I would say the most important part is freedom from discrimination and violence. We need that in all aspects of our lives in order to, to be healthy and to feel positive mental health. There's lots of ways of tackling stigma and discrimination. The way I differentiate it is stigma is a negative assumptions or stereotypes and attitudes. 
And discrimination is the action that results from negative stereotypes and attitudes. And, you know, Jennifer touched on that a little bit. All these assumptions around people with mental health and substance use issues, and especially the, the relationship with violence. And there's lots of ways in which discrimination impacts us. A lot of it we can see, right? The overt stuff, the actual actions between one person to another or group to another. But there's a lot of covert stuff things that are hidden, things that are embedded into our programs, our policies. And one that I will raise for you is the Mental Health Act. There is a Mental Health Act in every single province in this country. Now think about that. The Mental Health Act restricts the liberties of people with substance use and mental health issues, right? It actually puts the police officer in charge of determining if someone is a risk to themselves or others, a police officer can apprehend them and take them to a hospital emergency room. But think about it, do we have any other act like that? Is there a diabetes act or a cancer act or a cardiac act, right? But we have this mental health act specifically because of the way in which society has constructed the concept of mental health, that it's something that we all need to be afraid of. And so I wanna share some quick stats with you which come from the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And they say that just 50% of Canadians would tell friends or coworkers that they have a family member with a mental illness compared to 72% who would discuss the diagnosis of cancer, and 68% who would talk about a family member having diabetes. 42% of Canadians were unsure whether they would socialize with a friend with a mental health issue. 55% said that they would be unlikely to enter a spousal relationship with someone with a mental health, mental illness. And 27% said that they would be fearful of being around someone who suffers from a serious mental illness. And these fears are grounded in this misconception between violence and mental illness. And I think we really have to inter in interrogate that within our own work, but also in our own personal relationships. What are the fears that we have around this topic? And for me, there is a compounding impact because you can face discrimination due to a healthcare issue like a mental illness or substance use issue. And then you can face discrimination due to another aspect of identity, such as your race or gender uh, identity or gender expression or sexual orientation. And when those forms combine, there is this intersectionality that happens, this compounding impact, and that is detrimental to our health. I call this the health inequities trajectory. And this is really to try to help understand how discrimination actually impacts our health. So let's go down the list. So in terms of socioeconomic status, imagine that you're facing discrimination in the workplace. Either it's a challenge in, in um, landing a job in the labor market, or it's a barrier to advancing in your career. You know, you didn't get that promotion due to, uh, due to discrimination. Next, there's environmental exposure. This is like, you know, living in designated quote, high risk communities that are constantly over policed. All of these daily issues and, and aggressions have an impact on our mental health, can cause a lot of stress. And then we may turn to unhealthy health behaviors like drugs and alcohol as a way of, of coping with it. And then we might face barriers in accessing healthcare as well. And just like, um, uh, Jennifer mentioned, you know, there's disproportionate impacts of, of restraint use on racialized people. The same way it is in, in the justice system, it exists in the healthcare system. So here are some of the ways in which discrimination impacts our health. I love this picture. I share it a lot. It says a thousand words. So the person at the top, they have access to income, education, employment, and they're racing to their health. And the person on the bottom, they're bogged down by social, economic, and political marginalization. These are all the hurdles that they have to get through in order to be able to access their health. Steve mentioned uh, the inequities during COVID, and I want to share just some quick stats, uh, quick snapshots of some stats, because I think they, they really clearly paint a picture. 
And these stats are from Toronto Public Health and they're accurate up to December 31st of 2021. So this is a depiction of the cases of COVID-19 in Toronto compared to income. So you can see the uh, kind of teal or bluish greenish bars. Those are the income uh, quintiles. And the black bars are the, the share of COVID-19 cases. So you can see that as the income quintiles increase, the COVID cases decrease, right? So as someone's income increases, their risk factor for COVID decreases. And then you can see that more starkly with the hospitalization. So this is the exact same stats, but with hospitalizations, you can see the black bars as people's income increases, their rates of hospitalization decrease. And so this is really important to remember. And so when we look at um, health system strategies, we need to understand how are they disproportionately impact, impacting people of different income levels. Now let's look it down and break it down by race. So again, you see the, the darker, um, uh, the kind of, I don't know, greenish, yellowish bars. That is the proportion of Toronto's population by race. And the black bars are again, the, the, the rates of COVID-19 cases. So you can see on the very far right, Toronto's share of the white population is 48% and their share of COVID-19 cases is 31. But then you look over here at the South Asians, Toronto's share of South Asian community is 13%, but we are at 20% for COVID-19 cases. Let's look over here at the black community. The black community is 9% of Toronto's population, but 13% of COVID cases. And this is even more stark when we look at hospitalization rates. So again, Toronto's um, white population makes up 48%, but their uh, cases of COVID hospitalizations are only 34%. We look over here, Southeast Asian community, they make up 7% of Toronto, but 12% of hospitalizations. South Asians make up 13% of Toronto, but 15% hospitalization. I think the most stark one, again, you need to look at is Black communities. Although they're only 9% of the population in Toronto, they make up 16% of hospitalizations. This stat I share a lot. This is a picture of it, the, the, the blue line at the very top are the 20 neighborhoods that have the highest visible minority or racialized populations in Toronto. And the red one is um, the, uh, represents the 20 neighborhoods with the low, lowest income in Toronto. The light blue line is the 20 neighborhoods with the lowest racialized communities. And then the light pink line is uh, the 20 communities with highest income neighborhoods. And this dot here was the policy decision in March, 2020 to shut down, right? So the provincial policy decision, nationwide policy decision, health policy decision to, to do the shutdown. So you can see that the point in which the shutdowns happened, there was a great decrease in COVID cases for people in the highest income neighborhoods with the lowest racialized populations. But for people who live in the lowest income neighborhoods with the highest racialized populations, their COVID cases actually shot up after the shutdown. And that's because as Steve said earlier, because of the social and economic conditions, those are the individuals working in more high risk frontline jobs, right? Those are the individuals um, that were struggling. So when we make system policy decisions, we really need to think about who is this policy actually helping? And who is this policy hurting? So I'm going to take just two minutes um, to talk about how do we address uh, discrimination. And again, as you can probably figure out, I'm a very visual person. And I love this picture. You've probably seen it a million times. This is comparing reality, equality, equity, and then liberation. So we all understand the reality. There's so many inequities. In order to have equality, we're giving people the same thing, right? The same accommodation and hoping that works. But in this case, the short person still can't see the baseball game. With equity, now we've made accommodations so everyone can see the game, which is great. 
But what I want to encourage you to do as leaders, as unions, is to think about this liberation picture. Because in this case, we have actually removed the systemic barrier. We have taken that fence down. So now everyone can see the, the game. But the beauty of this part is that now no one needs an accommodation because now everyone can see the game fine just exactly as who they are because we have removed that systemic barrier. So when thinking about tackling discrimination, we really have to think about it at an individual community and systems level. And some um, uh, tactics that, that I wanna offer you is that at an individual level, it's so important to validate people's experience. So when your union member, when your colleague comes to you and say, hey, I think I just faced racism or I faced homophobia or Islamophobia at work today. The best thing you can do is to validate that because that was their experience and to support them in that moment. Because so many of us who face discrimination walk around thinking, did that really happen to me? I, I don't know if that really happened to me and thinking about it and worrying about it. So the best thing you can do is to validate, hey, I believe you, right? And how can I help you address the situation? At a community and program level, you know, Jennifer talked about it, engaging with people that, with lived experience in the design of programs is so important. And then collecting the data, because if you don't collect the data by community, by race, by income, you actually won't know what the disparities are. And my advice for policy change is the same thing. Engage people with lived experience at a systems policy level. Have their input from day one so that you know what you're designing is actually effective and will work on the ground. And then collect the data. It's really disappointing that Health Canada has not collected data by race across Canada during COVID-19. And there's been a few, few public health units that have collected that data so that we can actually see what the impact is. So we all need to be advocating for sociodemographic data collection, race-based data collection in all settings, because without that data, we don't actually know what the disparity is. And then of course, policy advocacy, even if you're in a frontline role, it's so important to remember how your role actually impacts the system. So we really do need policy level advocacy on all fronts. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks, Ukla, and uh, thanks, Jennifer. So um, I think it's, uh, according to my computer, it's 1118, which means the three of us are standing in between you guys and lunch. Uh, 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 because I think you're supposed to adjourn at about 11.30. Um, uh, this would be a good time if people have any comments or uh, questions that you want to raise with any of us on the panel. Uh, otherwise, I'll put a few questions at, uh, to Jennifer and, and, and Upala, or we can end early. Any questions from your end? Hi, Steve and Upala and uh, Jennifer. Thank you guys for the presentation. I have a question for uh, Upala. When you spoke about engaging policy changes and you suggested, you know, collecting data, who would we, I guess, um, approach to collect this data? Because I would assume it's an expensive undertaking. And who would you suggest uh, would sit on this committee that would collect the data and make those decisions to engage in the policy advocacy? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. And yes, you're right. It is not a cheap endeavor, right? But this is a building block for advancing equity. And so I think you got to think about in terms of data collection, what sector are you thinking about? If it's across your um, unions across Canada, then you need to think about in a very basic way, how can you collect data from your members? Right? And I've helped a lot of organizations establish race-based data and so socio-demographic data collection. There's lots of ways to do it and you can do it on the cheap, right? So if you want to um, start with your members, I would start with um, having a, a champion in your organization who believes in this, who sees the value in it and creating a you know, cross Canada committee to um, engage in the process. 
And then what you could do is really think about what are you wanting to and hoping to achieve with sociodemographic data? What are the ways in which you want to advance equity in your organization? Is it representation? You want to increase representation from communities across Canada? And then you would really think about what are the key questions that you want to ask your members in order to um, advance equity? And there's lots of like, you don't have to do it from scratch. There's so many examples to use. So in Ontario, we have the Anti-Racism Act and the Anti-Racism Data Standards that will give you the categories that you can ask individuals. Um, there's also amazing LGBTQ organizations that have wording of questions that you can ask them. And same thing with the mental health community. And you can do this on a voluntary basis, right? where you sent, you can even do it anonymously, where you send it to your members, say, we want to get a snapshot of what our membership looks like, so that if there are um, areas where we're not representing uh, the communities in Canada, we can increase them. I hope that that's a, a start to, uh, to answering your question. Okay, thank you. I have another question. Sure. Uh, thank you guys for your presentation. Uh, such a wonderful presentation today. So very valuable. Um, one question I wanted to ask uh, is a technology question actually. And uh, is how did you just do your presentation where your presentation was actually on the screen and we could see you speak at the same time because that was amazing. That was really amazing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, I actually have a MacBook. So if you share a screen on a Should MacBook, known it. <laughs> it, it, there's an option in the advanced settings that are called slides as virtual background. And then, um, and then you share your slides normally. But you just have I to it had to be that, uh, <laughs> that you don't have information in the corner that you're going to appear. Otherwise, people won't see that information. Awesome. No, and thank you. Uh, we have. Uh, we have worked very hard in our organization to, uh, with every communication every week to include um, a mental health uh, component uh, because we, we really understand and respect that um, everybody is struggling out there right now and everybody's struggling in a different way. So, uh, so thank you. This has been you know, an amazing morning. Thank you. Just to build on that last comment, um, you know, the CMHA across the country, so the national website, the Ontario Division website, and many of the local branches have, you know, chock-a-block information on mental health issues uh, that, you know, if, if, if you need resources, and most of them are free. Uh, I did mention in my um, uh, slide presentation that, you know, in terms of focusing on particular workplaces, um, the, uh, you know, there are, there are some options, both in terms of the Mental Health Commission uh, information. They have a toolkit on the psychological safety standard uh, and mental health works uh, will, as, will, as I mentioned, provide consultation. Just to pick up on Upala's comment about data, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, work is going on in various sectors to collect uh, race-based and equity data. So the hospitals in the Toronto area, for example, have been doing this uh, for a number of years. Uh, and it, it's now spreading to the community. It's called Because We Care uh, initiative. Uh, and, but it is a challenge because I think what, uh, so part of it is what question do you want to answer? Uh, is, it, is it really you know, a broader question about your members' access to um, mental health and addiction services? Or is it um, uh, you know, the impact of COVID? Or, so again, you need to think through what are you collecting the information for? And then also, you know, how do you intend to use the information once you collect it? I also encourage you um, when considering what changes are needed in your different areas of the country uh, to talk to the peer based organizations that exist in that area, because people who are on the receiving end of services are often looking for very different things than people who work in services. But there's a tendency to only talk to people who work in services. And I, don't, I can't think of any other group this would be true of. You know, if you're looking to understand women's experience, of health, uh, you wouldn't talk to say only male experts on women without actually asking women, <laughs> groups of women. Uh, but this happens all the time for people who've been on the receiving end of mental health services. So um, there are groups uh, scattered throughout the country. And if you have trouble finding them, you do have contact information for me. 
Uh, so I, I suggest that when having to dialogues about what to promote, uh, it's really important to include that voice. Yeah, uh, you know, just uh, to build on Jennifer's point, the Mental Health Commission, as I mentioned, had uh, Mary O'Hagan, who was a, a, a service user advocate from New Zealand, who was also one of their commissioners for mental health services, and Robin Priest, who now actually lives in Ontario, I believe, um, do an extensive review called Making the Case for Peer Support. And what they found was even though organizations weren't well-funded, as Jennifer pointed out, there were a fair number of them everywhere in the province, uh, everywhere in the country. And when they went deeper and they talked to people about their experience, people said like, this is actually probably the most important uh, thing I've been able to get to help me deal with my issues. Uh, it, it, uh, the, the importance of peer support. So I think, um, and, and there's a, I think there's probably a natural alliance between unions and peer organizations at the community level. I'll give you one example of how peer support can work. There's an organization in Toronto that's actually geared to economic supports. Um, they had a member who was constantly sort of cycling in and out of hospital because she would hear voices and the voices would often come from her, her furniture. Um, so what, when that started happening again, um, she was hearing a voice from her sofa um, and people had already used all sorts of medications and involuntary hospitalizations on her. This group just changed her sofa. So she was fine for months <laughs> until they needed to exchange for another sofa. Practical things. So I think we have a, about three minutes before uh, you folks, uh, I think, want to adjourn. Although we can we have one more question, Steve. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, more of a just a quick oh, comment. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, sorry, I missed that one. Two more questions, then I'll save mine for the last. Hello, good morning, Upal, Jennifer, and Steve. Thank you for being here. Um, my question is towards uh, Upal. You said that uh, if someone is involved in maybe a mental health or racism incident, uh, one way to help them is in validating uh, what happened to them. And uh, so, like, I've experienced that before when I tried uh, validating and like helping them, but I said, like, how can I help you? And they're like, I don't know. I don't know what I need, but you can see that they're troubled. So what would be your next step in the assisting that person? Yeah, I think it's it's so interesting that you asked us and thank you for your question. I actually have spent the last three months um, educating social workers about how to look at racism as trauma because that's what that is, right? And it's a traumatic moment. And as healthcare providers, we're very good at trauma-informed care practice. We understand that when someone has a car crash or they have gone to war, that that is traumatic. But what we need to actually think about is how racism and all forms of discrimination, homophobia, Islamophobia, you know, anti-indigeneity, how these are acts of violence. And so how do we support someone who has experienced a moment of violence? And it is a really complicated response that I unfortunately can't answer in 30 seconds. But the fact that you validate their experience and say, I believe you, that goes a long way to supporting their mental health. Even if they don't know how they need to be helped in that moment, it could be something as simple as, you know, getting them some water or asking if they need to, to call someone for support or do they need the rest of the day off? right? So that they can go home and process what had just happened at work. These kinds of human responses are so important because oftentimes we brush it aside and pretend that it doesn't happen. And that actually has detrimental impacts on our, on our health. And so I would say if, you know, a member is approaching you and lets you know that this has happened to them, the best thing you can do for their health is to say, I believe you. And how can I help you? What do you want to do about it? And if in that moment they don't know, and that's okay, because that's also a trauma response, right? We don't know what we need in that moment because we're still processing, but maybe not let it go, right? Maybe the next week or the next time you see them, pull them aside, say, how are you doing? How did everything work out? What else can I do to help you? Or do we need to talk to someone else that can help you? That's really, for me, the best response in the moment. 
Um, so not so much a question, but just a plug for the um, mental health first aid course that CMHA offers. I took it uh, probably about five or six years ago, and it was a game changer. And just actually segueing on this topic, it taught me the importance of referring <laughs> to the experts. Um, you are not an expert in situations, but you try to be when someone's in crisis, you try to do everything you can to help them. But I think one of the biggest things that tours the course taught me was how to help them in that moment and then refer them to the experts to get um, the help after that moment has passed kind of and going forward. And so um, I think that point's excellent. Be there for them, be a human being, validate them, listen to them, do not gaslight them. Um, and, and, and understand that it's okay that that might be your limit to help. That might be where your expertise in the situation ends. And that's where you need to, um, just like you said, help find other people, other counselors, friends, community members, those peer organizations that offer supports. Um, that's where you, I think, refer them. So um, as union members and board reps and those kind of things, I would um, highly encourage everyone to take the CMHC Mental Health First Aid course. It has been beneficial in my personal life, my professional life, um, and especially my union life. Thank and you for your presentation and, and all the great information today. Thanks for that. And uh, the Mental Health Commission, I think, uh, has tried to coordinate uh, the availability of mental health first aid resources across the country. And actually, they're, they're hoping to train hundreds of thousands of Canadians in mental health first aid. And so you, uh, I, um, I think if you just plug mental health first aid into your search engine, you can probably uh, figure out how to connect across the country. And it is, it, it, it's a, it's a, um, a, a, a wonderful uh, a program. Dan Fisher in the United States, who's a leading consumer advocate, has um, developed uh, a, a service user-led uh, version of it that uh, that he argues is better. Uh, but and you can search that under Dan Fisher. Uh, but ECPR. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, emotional CPR. I thought, yeah, that's what it is. So anyway, thanks to all of you for having us. Uh, we hope that uh, two hours and a bit. Uh, uh, went well for you, and uh, um, you've got. Uh, we can make sure that you get all our slides. Um, and thanks so much for having us. No, I, uh, Steve, uh, Jennifer, and Upala. Thank you very much, it's Kelly Johnson. Um, it was a great presentation. Thank you for your time today. You've enlightened us. Uh, thank you for the material. We'll provide that with the rest of the group. Um, again, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your outlook and uh, helping us bring back uh, what we need to learn to our members. So thank you very much. And I want to give a shout out to Dawn Burns for all her work uh, trying to uh, herd the cats here and, uh, yeah. and the technical team. So thanks. Without you guys, we wouldn't have been able to do it. So uh, it was great. Thank you so much. And uh, and uh, you'll be receiving something on behalf of the CCU shortly. Okay, thank you. Thank very you much. very much. Bye bye. Good.